Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you that we can come together and prepare our hearts for the Christmas season and begin to focus on um, the different elements of um, your son coming to earth as a baby in a manger. And I pray, Lord, that this would be a, a morning filled with joy, a morning filled with celebration, a morning where we could turn our eyes away from the cares of this world and, and focus on what you've give, given us and what you've done for us and just who you are. And may that fill our hearts with joy. We just pray for every person who's here, that you would bless them and give us ears to hear what you'd have to say to us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. ago, my family visited uh, uh, one of these really big, uh, impressive churches, you know, their services, they have these rock bands and professional lights and spots and gels and all sorts of things. And, you know, the colors were sort of changing as the band was playing and as everybody was singing. And when the service was over, my husband is an extrovert, so he got in a conversation with somebody who had been sitting near us. 
And uh, this was obviously a gentleman who had not been to this church before. So one of the questions that he asked Paul was, what do the colors mean? He thought that because the lights were changing colors as the band was playing, there must be a reason for that. The colors must mean something. And, you know, we kind of had to say, well, we think they do that because it looks cool. And, I mean, it does look cool. But sometimes in church, the colors do mean something. For example, our Advent wreath. The colors of an Advent wreath are purple and white and pink. Purple represents, uh, to, the, um, to the people who wrote the Bible, the color of purple was really special. It represented royalty because it was really expensive and only very, very wealthy, powerful people could get their hands on it. So purple was a royal color. But it also had a, had a connotation of, of suffering and mourning. So throughout church history, uh, whenever there's been a purple candle, it's indicated that Jesus was our king who came to suffer for us. You know, it's not just about this window over here where Jesus is born. It's also about the windows that tell the story over here where Jesus was crucified for us and suffered. So purple represents royalty and suffering. The white candle represents uh, not just purity, which is sort of where our mind might go, but it also means light. And it also means victory. And the white candle, when we light that on Christmas Eve, that's the Christ candle. And it tells us that Christ is victorious. You know, he was not defeated. He was not overcome. He was victorious. This morning's candle, the joy candle, is pink. And that's kind of interesting because you might not get why pink represents joy. And I had to look this up, and I found it really interesting. The idea behind the pink candle is that pink is as close as you can get to purple, but without the darkness. It represents Christ's kingship without his suffering, with the joy that he brings into the world with his birth. That's why our joy candle is pink. And uh, the McCall family are going to be coming to light that candle. And as we, uh, as we watch them light that candle, um, I want to remind you of some words that, that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you guys, go ahead and write, light the pink candle and two of the purple ones. Um, and we're going to read together some words that will be on the screen as they light the candle. We light this candle because we live in joy. We wake every day knowing what God has promised. The Lord will comfort his people. He will make the desert into a garden. His people will come home singing and they will be crowned with endless joy. God has promised, and his promise will be kept. We light this candle because we live in joy. Amen. And thank you, guys. Father, we thank you that we can pour our praise before you. And this morning, we celebrate joy. We just pray, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning, that you would touch our hearts and let joy arise within us. Lord, please bless this word to, to our hearts. Take my weak words, infuse them with your power of your Holy Spirit, and give us ears to hear, Lord, what it is you'd have to say to us. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. And take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So years ago, I was at a young adult's Bible study at uh, Francois's house. Not Francois, it's an E at the end, it's a girl. Francois, a fellow. And uh, we used to have our Bible studies there. And uh, we were asked to describe the things that give us joy. 
And I think I must have been in a mood that morning, that evening when I didn't want to sound super spiritual because everybody was kind of sound, doing spiritual things. And I said, you know what gives me real joy? When I watch a really good hockey game. And I watch the teams are, are even and they're, you know, it's exciting and it goes down to the last minute. I mean, I do enjoy watching sports and I have fond memories of watching games in Montreal in person that were just amazing, but is enjoy the same as bringing joy? Are those things that make me happy or do they bring me joy? Are they really the same thing? It's possible to find moments of joy even in difficult situations, but we'd be hard pressed to call those times joyful in and of themselves. When my mom and I talk on the phone, we laugh a lot. Her sense of humor is still really good, and, but, but also every conversation also contains my mom's frustrations at not being able to remember things. And while there are moments of joy, it's hard to say that there's a joyfulness in everything. This Sunday in Advent, we're looking at joy. Joy can be something elusive in our world today. It gets confused so often with happiness, like I did. It can be elusive when we are in the middle of sad and even tragic situations. I can think of my, people in my neighborhood that I have never once seen them smile. And at the other extreme, there are people who always seem joyful. They're always positive and perky, and one wonders if they're really kind of living a Pollyanna life, just ignoring the reality of pain and difficulty to exhibit this kind of false joy because they feel that that's what I'm supposed to do. Where are we supposed to find joy? Is it really in a hockey game? Where can we find joy in difficult situations? Where can we find a joy that's real? And so we want to look this morning at some scriptures that speak to us of joy in hopes that we will come to understand where we can find joy, a joy that is deep-seated, a joy that is lasting. And the first thing that scripture calls us to rejoice in is exactly what Bob said in his testimony and his prayer request, is to rejoice in our salvation. The fact that we've been forgiven, that Jesus Christ has saved us and is working by his Holy Spirit to make us into the people that he created us to be. Psalm 13, 5 and 6 reads, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. In Luke 10, 20, Jesus tells his disciples that they are not to rejoice in any great success that they may have had in ministry, but that rather they are to rejoice that their names are written down in heaven. Maybe if joy is hard to find this Christmas season, one thing we might need to do is focus on the importance, on the value of our salvation. Think about what our life was like before Jesus saved us and compare it to what it's like now. And if you've been saved since you were a kid and maybe you've got nothing to compare, you know, life post-Jesus and life pre-Jesus, well, think about where you might be without him. And rejoice in the fact that you, you did nothing to earn your salvation. You did nothing to deserve it. It's a free gift of God's grace. Rejoice that your spirit has been made alive in Christ and that by the Holy Spirit you've come to understand and, and appreciate the things that the Spirit teaches us and that the Spirit does in our lives. And rejoice that in your salvation your name is written in heaven. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us so that where he is we may be also forever. And may the thought of heaven bring a joy to your heart that will have an impact on how we live life on earth today. If the joy of Christmas is hard to find, this may be the first place to start. Accept Christ's salvation as freely offered to you. Deeply consider the reason for the baby in the manger, born to die for our sins. Ask for forgiveness and, and welcome him into your life. And then the joy of Christmas will begin to take hold like it never has before. Secondly, we can rejoice in what God has done for us. Psalm 126, 2 and 3 tells us, Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. 
Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Usually we focus on Thanksgiving as a time for, well, Thanksgiving. But maybe Christmas also needs to be a time of reflecting, a time to consider the goodness of our God, a time to be filled with joy as we realize all of the great things that the Lord has given us and has done for us. I was talking with one of my students this week online, and she pointed out how important it is to recognize the hand of God in our lives in all things, to recognize his work in our everyday, in the things we consider to be routine and ordinary and mundane. God is intently interested in every single aspect of our lives, and he's constantly at work in us, and he's working around us to accomplish his good work. We're called to stop and consider his work. To stop and consider his works is something that brings joy, joy to our hearts. So if the joy of Christmas is something that's hard to find, maybe we need to make a, a Christmas list and check it twice. Not a shopping list of gifts to buy for family and friends, but a Thanksgiving list. A list of all the ways God has been so good to us. A list of the great things he has done in our lives. A list that will help spark joy in our hearts. And in doing that, we're not, kind of, we're not ignoring reality. We're not living a Pollyanna life. We're not dismissing or ignoring the pain in our lives or in, or in the lives of others. Rather, we're recognizing that even in the middle of tragedy, uncertainty, and pain, God's purposes for our lives will be fulfilled. True, we might have to look a little harder to see past the pain, to see his hand at work. But if we stop and take the time and look, we will see his hand at work in our lives. And in the midst of sorrow, he will bring joy. Third, we need to understand that joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Happiness is, but joy is not. Things around us can make us happy or unhappy, but joy is something that comes from within. Joy is something we can hold on to even when, in humanly speaking, circumstances would dictate otherwise. The book of Habakkuk is a story of the people of Israel lodging a complaint against God for the, the difficult circumstances they find themselves in. And there's this back and forth dialogue in the three short chapters between God and his people. And in the final verses of Habakkuk, the prophet comes to a powerful conclusion about the reality of joy in tough times. And he writes, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit and no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He's saying, even though all these calamities have hit my life, even though things are not going my way, even though there doesn't seem to be a way out in the immediate future, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I've been reading a book late recently in this one section that focuses on this passage. And from it, the author challenges his readers to have a faith that he describes as, even though, dot, 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 I will. Even though, I will. Even though things are challenging, I will rejoice in the Lord. Even though things are difficult, I will put my faith in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord, for he has been good to me. If the joy of Christmas is hard to find this year, maybe we need to realize that joy is not dependent on our situation, not dependent on our circumstances. If we rely on good times for our joy, we will be disappointed when those good times pass. And if we let bad times dictate our joy, then we're allowing the enemy to rob us of God's good gift to us. For God wants to build in us an even though, dot, 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 I will type of faith. Wants to build in us a determination and a perseverance that will see us through. Wants us to know him more so that we can know that he can be trusted. 
trusted to work all things out for our good, work all things out for his glory. That he can be trusted to take even the most challenging situations and even if that seems impossible, make something good. Make something, something good come out of it. So even though my circumstances may not call for joy, I will still rejoice. For I trust and I believe that God is somehow at work in these circumstances. There are a couple of things in scripture that we're told to rejoice in that may on the surface may not be the first things we think of when it comes to being joyful. Might not, might not be the 11th or 12th thing. It's quite a ways down the list, you know, humanly speaking. But these are to be sources of joy for the Christian. Scripture tells us repeatedly that we are to rejoice if we find ourselves persecuted for Jesus' sake. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me, Jesus is saying. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets that were before you. For most of us, if we were to make a list of the things that would make us joyful, I think we'd be hard-pressed to include on the list being insulted, being persecuted, and being slandered. But here Jesus is telling us that if these things are happening to us because of our faith, because of what we believe, because we live our lives according to God's standards rather than the world's, then we are to consider ourselves blessed and we are to rejoice. For while we may not feel very rewarded here, great is our reward in heaven. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. The joy comes in the fact that when we're insulted, when we're persecuted for our faith, we are following in Christ's footsteps. We're identifying with him. We are experiencing just a taste of what he experienced. We are to rejoice that we are counted worthy to share in his sufferings. Rejoice that that the world around us recognizes Jesus in us enough to persecute us and get on our case and to begin to treat us as it treated him. And we are to rejoice in the fact that when when we may lose in this life, we will gain in heaven. Joy is also found in doing God's work, in participating in Christ's ministry of bringing people to him, appointing them to a way to a relationship with God. Joy is found in helping the lost be found. And Jesus models this in the parable of the, of the lost sheep in Luke 15. And he compares himself to a shepherd who's caring for this big flock of sheep, and suddenly he realizes that one is missing. And the good shepherd will do all he can to go. He'll leave the rest of the flock secure in the pen, and he'll go and look after that and find that one who is lost. And when he finds it, Jesus says, he joyfully picks it up and puts it on his shoulders and carries him home, joyfully. And then he calls his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. One of the significant ways that we grow in maturity as a Christian, and one of the ways I think many of us as Christians neglect, is by finding joy in helping lost people find their way home. Reaching out to those who are having a hard time finding God and helping them kind of break through the fog and see God for who he is. To seek the lost with perseverance and with compassion and taking great joy that they have finally found God and come home. This may not seem very joyful on the surface. It's it's a lot of work to answer all, all the questions people might have. It's a lot of work to invest time in people, to help people work through all the stuff that they have in their life. And all the questions and, and uncertainties they have and help them find their way to Christ. And there may be rejection involved. 
I think a lot of us avoid evangelism because we don't like rejection. I think I'm there sometimes. Um, there might even be insults. But scripture tells us that the angels in heaven rejoice over just one person, one sinner who repents. Don't you want to be part of that party? Don't you want to be part of that rejoicing? After all the pain of labor, there are a few moments more joyful than the look on a mother's face when the newborn baby is, is laid on her chest. The road to spiritual rebirth for some people might be a long and difficult labor, and it might be painful, but God is looking for his people who are willing to walk that road alongside of them, to walk that road with your family members, to walk that road with your friends, and it may be a hard road, but the joy comes with the rebirth that makes it all worthwhile. As I was thinking about this, it makes me think of Wendy's face. I've rarely seen a face beaming with such joy, a smile stretching from ear to ear, a joy in her eyes. She was overflowing with rejoicing, Wendy from my home church in Montreal. And what made it seem so out of place is this was at a funeral. It was at her father's funeral. But the reason for her joy quickly became apparent as she explained that her father had resisted giving his life to God. His entire life had resisted opening his heart to God for his whole life. But the time came when he was very sick. The time came when he was dying. And Wendy had the honor of leading her father to salvation in Jesus just a few days before he died. And the joy on her face came from the fact that she was used by God to bring her father to salvation, used by God to bring her father home. And as well, the joy in her face was from the knowledge that she would one day see her father again. If the joy of Christmas is hard to find this year, maybe we need to begin looking in places where we might least expect to find joy. Maybe we need to begin living a life for Christ that will draw people to him, where we will have the privilege of leading people to a relationship with Christ, have the privilege of helping the lost become found. And it may be a long road and a difficult road to walk with people along that path, but it's a road that will lead to joy. And maybe in living this life for Christ, we may not only attract people to the faith, but we may also attract insults. And mistreatment. And if that's the case, we will be like many, many, many who have gone before, including Jesus himself. And any time we can say that we are becoming like Jesus, that's a reason for joy. We mentioned before that we can find joy in considering what God has done for us in the past. And, and that's very true. But joy also comes not only from what God does, but from who God is. When you get right down to it, we find our joy not in circumstances and not in events, but in a person. Our joy is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Psalm 1611, the psalmist writes, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Joy comes in the presence of God, ultimately. Philippians 4.4 4 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. And that's one of those passages that I like that it's got a full sentence to it. it doesn't, it's not just a command to rejoice. It doesn't just say, come on, be happy, put on a happy face. Don't you know that things are good no matter what's happening to you? No. It says rejoice in the Lord. Because of who he, not, but not simply because of what he's done for us, but simply because of who he is. Our joy is dependent not on our circumstances or on experiencing things that make us happy. Our joy is found in a person, in a relationship with that person. Our joy is found in the presence of Jesus. And when times are really hard, and when we're looking for answers, and we're asking, why are all these things happening to me? And joy is extremely elusive. It seems anything but joyful. God doesn't give us answers. 
He gives us himself. He gives us his presence. His presence where joy is found. If the joy of Christmas is hard to find this year, maybe we need to carve out time in our busy schedules just to be in the presence of Jesus. And also to recognize that whatever we're doing, we are always in the presence of Jesus. And we need to recognize that and make that top of mind in our thinking. To recognize that it is in those times of intentionally being in Jesus' presence and in recognizing Jesus' presence in our lives, that is where our joy is found. It is in the presence of God that we find joy. A joy that is deep-seated, a joy that is lasting, a joy that will give us what we need to face whatever it is that life throws at us. For scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I pray that in these next couple of weeks, that amidst everything we do for Christmas, amidst the happy times, amidst the, the, the very difficult times that some people are going through that we've prayed about and the difficult times that some of us in this room might be going through that no one else knows about. I pray, Lord, that in those moments we would find joy. We would think back to your goodness and all that you've done for us. And we would rejoice in that. We would recognize who you are and that you long to give us your very self you long to call us into your presence, and that in your presence we would find joy. That we would find joy in, in ministering to others and helping the lost be found, walking that road with them no matter, no matter how long it takes. That we would find joy even in insults, and persecution in your name. Father, I pray for anyone here that, that, that where the joy of Christmas is difficult to find. And if that reason is because they don't know you yet, haven't found that salvation, I just pray, Lord, that they would be able to find that even now and come home. Just by praying a simple prayer like, Lord, I know you're there. I know you made me. But I've been kind of leaving you on the back burner. Lord, come into my life. I'm sorry for the things I've done that have hurt you, hurt others, and hurt myself. Take over my life, Lord, and help me find your joy and your peace. Thank you, Lord, that even in those simple words and that simple faith, salvation is found and joy is found. And I just pray, Lord, that in the days and these days to come, that in whatever is going on in our lives, we would see your hand at work and we would find joy. In Jesus' name, amen. It's early and we haven't sang a whole lot and that was intentional because we want to rejoice with some Christmas carols. And so we're going to sing a bunch of carols together. If you want to stand and sing, you can do that. Have your mask on. If you want to sit and sing, that's fine. Let's rejoice together, shall we? If you found a noisemaker in your pew, feel free to be the designated noisemaker for your row. Um, let's uh, sing these carols of joy and celebration. All right. <clears throat> Take it away. Mm -hmm. 